but whatever the reason, these compounds are very, very smelly. They're not the smelliest compounds because the selenium analogues are even worse. In this lab, before it was refurbished and new benches were put in, there was a small spillage of a selenium thiol at a weekend, and the whole building had to be evacuated. Any guesses what we're making today? Back in July, I gave YouTube its first look at thioacetone, which is claimed by many to be the stinkiest chemical on Earth. And I've got to admit, this stuff was pretty potent. Oh! <laughs> oh, man! <laughs> but I didn't actually find it all that offensive. I mean, sure, it was sulfury, and a few grams could be smelled from hundreds of feet away, but it wasn't exactly unbearable. This result honestly left me pretty dissatisfied, and I vowed that one day I would create a smell truly abominable enough to merit my genuine discomfort. And then, just before Christmas, this happened. Before I go though, I want to quickly mention another YouTuber named Labcoats, who technically made the thioacetone before me. I only realized this after I had already filmed everything and was putting the video together, but either way, I think he deserves credit for being the first one to do it, and I definitely recommend checking him out if you want another opinion. As soon as I saw this, I knew the time had come. The time for me to come out of stink retirement and finally blow thioacetone out of the water once and for all. Now, when declaring war on a chemical, one must first find its weakness. Looking closely at thioacetone's molecular structure, one can see that it's an organosulfur compound. And if the myths are to be believed, the only way to beat sulfur in a battle of stench is with its scarier, more dangerous older brother, selenium. So I tried looking up a selenium analog of thioacetone, but found nothing. I was feeling pretty lost, until I remembered the words of wisdom spoken by the godfather of crazy YouTube chemistry. Once again, have to go back to the source of all information, not YouTube, Germany. Germany. And, as the prophecies foretold, German Wikipedia held all the answers. One quick search, and I found a whole page on selenoketones, which thankfully confirmed the existence of the elusive selenoacetone that I was after, and it even gave a brief description of its synthesis. Apparently, passing hydrogen selenide through acetone with some kind of acid catalyst is all it takes to get the red selenoacetone dimer. This, by itself, was pretty encouraging news, but I wanted to know more before proceeding, so I kept searching for a few more hours and eventually came up with two scientific papers that discussed the synthesis of diselenoacetone. Much to my delight, both seemed to agree on a common synthesis that was very similar to the one discussed by the Germans, but this time, the acidic acetone mixture was more clearly specified as a 50-50 mix of cold acetone and hydrochloric acid. Now, I'm sure a few of my more chem-savvy viewers have already spotted a major red flag in this synthesis. Hydrogen selenide is an extremely dangerous substance. Ounce per ounce is more poisonous than cyanide, and it is highly irritating to the eyes and respiratory tract. Not to mention it smells like garbage and rotting food. I may be crazy, but I'm not stupid enough to create large amounts of this gas at home. So how did I get around the issue and make diselenoacetone? Two words, in situ. In situ is Latin for on site, and in chemistry, it refers to the process of making a chemical for a reaction within the reaction environment itself. In this case, we want to make the hydrogen selenide within the acetone solution, so very little has a chance to escape. And the reagent I chose to perform this task was something called aluminum selenide. This compound is fairly sensitive to water and acid, so mixing it with our solution should cause it to react and form hydrogen selenide at a fairly controlled speed. To make the aluminum selenide, I really only needed two ingredients, aluminum powder and selenium. Fortunately, I recently had both of these reagents sponsored to me by Backyard Science 2000, who runs an eBay store that sells a ton of unique chemicals. This was one of the selenium chunks he sent me, and while it looks quite stunning, it had to be completely crushed up before I could use it. So, I dropped it into my mortar and pestle and ground it up into a fine powder. This wasn't actually too difficult, since selenium is about as brittle as rock candy. Once the selenium was ground up and added to a test tube, a few scoops of aluminum powder were mixed in thoroughly, and the main reaction was initiated with a bit of gentle heating from my blowtorch. As soon as the reaction cooled down, the test tube was cracked open and the fresh aluminum selenide was extracted. 
Things were going pretty well, until a few minutes passed and I started to realize the stinky potential of selenium. You see, small amounts of atmospheric moisture were able to react with the aluminum selenide, which in turn released a microscopic amount of its awful relative, hydrogen selenide. The levels weren't high enough to be immediately dangerous, but they were potent enough to be smelled, even through my respirator. Up close, it stank like rotten eggs, but further away, it smelled more like rotting garbage. And apparently, a microscopic amount of aluminum selenide managed to escape, because for the next week or so, the residual stench of selenium continued to haunt my garage. But now, the hard part was basically done. All I had to do next was mix up a 50-50 mix of acetone and hydrochloric acid, and head out to a remote location for testing. Still, something didn't feel quite right. This was almost too easy. I couldn't just make one selenoketone and be done. That just wouldn't be scientific. For this to be a proper test, I would need something to compare it to. So, I decided to make a type of related organoselenium compound, called a selenol. Basically, it's an alcohol with oxygen swapped out for selenium. And this was the type of chemical mentioned by periodic videos that apparently reeked enough to clear a whole building of chemists. So it seemed only logical that I make some. To synthesize my selenols, I followed the procedure detailed by this paper, which was written fairly recently in late 2021. Basically, it entails mixing elemental selenium with sodium borohydride in an ice-cold ethanol solution, and then adding an alkyl halide and an acid to get the target selenol, which typically appears as a clear liquid that can be solvent extracted with something like chloroform. In my case, I actually had two alkyl halides in mind that I wanted to try, one for dibromobutane and isopropyl chloride. I chose the 1,4-dibromobutane because I had it on hand, and it was very similar to the 1,3-dibromopropane used in the paper. Besides, I figured it would be good to have a diselenol to compare the ordinary selenol and selenoketone with. And with the isopropyl chloride, I figured the isopropane selenol formed by it would make for good contrast to selenoacetone, since the end product would be almost identical on a molecular level, except for an additional hydrogen connected to the main selenium atom. Now, theories are great and all, but nothing quite compares to real-life experience. So I weighed out each of my reagents, packed everything up, and headed to an abandoned campground to set my organoselenium nightmares free. At the site, I set up a sort of mini lab in the back of my dad's van, and jumped right into making my first organoselenium compound, diselenoacetone. To do this, an arbitrary amount of acetone was combined with a slightly greater volume of hydrochloric acid in a 4 gram vial. Then, the aluminum selenide powder was mixed in, causing the solution to bubble gently. These bubbles were primarily hydrogen selenide, and since that's something you don't exactly want lingering in the back of your vehicle, the reaction was moved downwind to a safer location. And while the acetone solution was reacting elsewhere, I moved on to making the isopropane selenol. To synthesize this compound, 6 milliliters of ethanol were added to yet another 4 gram vial, followed by 1.25 grams of sodium borohydride. Then, 1.3 grams of selenium was gradually mixed in. Optimally, this would be done in an ice bath, but I unfortunately forgot to bring one. During this part of the reaction, the selenium reacts with the sodium borohydride and ethanol to produce sodium hydroselenide, triethyl borate, and hydrogen gas. This hydrogen, along with the highly exothermic nature of this reaction, is why you should cool the mixture in an ice bath and add the selenium slowly. You can see that my reaction mix got a little thick as more selenium was added, and this was because I didn't have enough solvent present to keep the sodium hydroselenide dissolved. The authors of the selenol paper actually recommended using an additional solvent called dimethylformamide, or DMF, which complexes with the hydroselenide. This probably would have given a better result and a smoother reaction, but I didn't have any DMF at the time. Anyway, once the reaction calmed down, 1.3 grams of isopropyl chloride was added to the mixture, followed by 1.6 milliliters of 30% hydrochloric acid. The authors didn't talk much about this part of the reaction, but from what I can tell, it's basically an acid-catalyzed double displacement that swaps the halide on the alkyl group for the hydroselenide portion of the sodium hydroselenide, forming the final selenol. Whatever the case, it seemed to work just fine. Ooh! Got some... Can keep this on for now. Once I was done messing with the isopropane selenol, I basically repeated the same synthesis, but with 1.8 grams of 1,4-dibromobutane instead of isopropyl chloride. 
And this time, before I even add the hydrochloric acid, something unnerving happened. Oh. I smelled something. Through my respirator, I could smell an unfamiliar odor with unprecedented potency and repulsiveness. So he grabbed the vial and brought it over with the other samples for testing. After all the waiting and preparation, it was finally time for me to take off my mask and see just how bad selenium could possibly be. Spoiler alert, it was pretty bad. Um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna make this brief because I wanna put my gas mask back on, but this is way more offensive than thioacetone. Rip, we're good. I am not making this up. This is my genuine reaction. Last time I kind of, I honestly kind of played it up a little bit for the thioacetone. This is 100% genuine. This is absolutely awful smelling. The smell, like, it's, a, it's similar to thioacetone. They're all similar in that range of like, kind of sulfury smell, even though there's, there's no sulfur in this. But, the smell of it's like, it's like the Wikipedia article said. It's very garlicky. It's like a very intense garlic smell. It's um, it's very different from hydrogen selenide, even though there there's definitely some hydrogen selenide still present here. Um, but it's yeah, it's just very garlicky. It's very very disgusting. In our case, we got a kind of more yellowish oil uh, instead of a red one. That might be just uh, I'm not sure why that might be, but. Yeah, it definitely, it's, it's definitely unique from hydrogen selenide, so we got the selenium acetone. I'm gonna get my mask on. Okay. This is the, in theory, isopropyl selenol, made from the isopropyl chloride that I made. And, honestly... This one seems to have faded a little bit. Honestly, a lot of the isopropyl chloride evaporated as soon as it hit the hot solution. So, there's probably what, not a lot of it in here. So. Ooh. Yeah, this one is... It's similar to thioacetone in low concentrations. Like, it smells like natural gas, basically. Mm. Or, you know, the chemical they add to natural gas. But... It has a it has a sweetness to it that I'm not a fan of. Um, I would say it's kind of like a kind of cooked vegetable almost, like cooked asparagus maybe. I don't know. Yeah. So that's kind of a kind of nasty. Yeah. Let's do my personal favorite. All right, last but certainly not least is the one made from the 1,4 dibromobutane. Honestly, this one, this one came straight from hell. It is very, very unpleasant to be around. I mean, I'll have a little bit more hydrochloric acid just to Get a little more going. Oh. Oh. That is that is genuinely the one or at least one of the worst smells that I've ever ever smelled. This this is far worse than thioacetone. Yeah. That one really has the garlicky kind of... Yeah, it's kind of garlicky, kind of oniony, but like... Oh! Mm. It's not as much the, the smell itself as the, as the actual strength of the smell. You can... It's very... Yeah, thioacetone was strong. This is... You can taste it. This is remarkably strong, at least up close. We haven't done a distance test yet. 
We'll probably do that quick, real quick before the sun goes completely down. But yeah, this here, this smells like rotting garbage, uh, not even rotten eggs. This is like, uh, this is in a league all of its own. Here, I'll try to describe it. Yeah, it's almost something like, again, kind of vegetal almost, like decaying vegetable matter, like a uh, horseradish maybe. I mean, this is the worst smell I have ever smelled. I'll have my dad react to it real quick, just see. Maybe he can describe the smell better. Yeah, it's, it's really garlicky. Does it have anything else that you can smell that's kind of different? It's really hard to, to put. I can't really, um, really give a good comparison to anything. I mean, the main, the main smell to me is the garlic. It re really smells that way. Um, but then there's some, there's some components to it that uh, are kind of in a league all on their own. That, but like I said, it's the smell itself is not what get you it's it's the the force in which the potency of it it gets you when it gets you <laughs> it's kind of like you don't smell it and then all of a sudden you smell it and when you smell it you smell it, it it's really hard and really fast and and it's very uh, strong after determining that 1,4 butane diselenol was by far the worst of the bunch we set up for a distance test I honestly wasn't expecting the smell to travel very far, since selenium is a much heavier element than sulfur, but... Oh man, I can smell it. Oh man. I can't believe I can smell that. Upon measuring the distance, we found that the smell carried over 300 feet downwind, with minimal loss in intensity. For reference, thioacetone stench faded just beyond 200 feet in our previous test, and that was while it was being vigorously heated by a blowtorch. In spite of the stories, I honestly wasn't expecting such an impressive result. So now, after all this, what are my final thoughts on selenium? Well, having now traveled down the twisted path of selenium chemistry for myself, I can officially say that the myths are true. Organoselenium compounds are far worse than their sulfurous cousins and 1,4-butane diselenol just might be the worst of the bunch. Its smell is so unique and so potent that I still have a hard time describing it. I've gone over it several times now, and at the moment, the closest thing I can compare it to is rotting garlic mixed with fermenting sewage. I don't want to declare this the stinkiest substance on earth, but honestly, when it comes to far-reaching, highly offensive smells, this compound and its relatives truly have no match. Well, until I get bored and mess with tellurium, of course. Now, I know a few of my followers have expressed an interest in smelling this substance for themselves. If you're one of those curious viewers, I might be able to help you. All you have to do is donate $25 or more to my channel using the link in the video description. Just type out your name and address in the payment description box, and I'll send you a few milligrams in a polypropylene vial as soon as possible. New Patreon members who pledge $10 or more will also be sent a sample, if they want it. Act quickly, this offer only applies while supplies last. And now, before I go, I'd like to talk a little about the sponsor behind this video, Brilliant.org. Brilliant.org is an online learning platform with over 60 different courses covering a wide variety of topics. If you've watched the entire video up to this point, then you just might enjoy this course, entitled The Chemical Reaction. I know I certainly did. Learning with Brilliant is remarkably easy, despite the content being on par with some of my college courses. The interactive questions spread throughout the course are great for interactive learners like myself. And if you get a question wrong, no worries. Brilliant will give you a handy explanation for each problem that they present, so you won't be left confused. With Brilliant, you can learn specific skills like chemistry or geometry, or simply challenge yourself to become a better thinker with courses like scientific thinking, which I'm still engaging with. The possibilities are nearly endless with the number of courses that they release, and the best part is you can get started for free. Just visit brilliant.org slash labcoats or click on the link in the video description to sign up. The first 200 of you to sign up will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Act fast, because these deals are totally worth it. Alright guys, that's it. You now know a little more about the mysterious and stinky world of selenium chemistry. Thank you all very much for watching. 
I had a great time making this video, and I hope you all learned something in the process. If you like what you see, consider subscribing to my channel. Trust me, I have a ton of new, exciting videos coming out soon that you do not want to miss. For instance, check this out. I distilled a super acid in my garage. And in another episode, I'll be showing off pyrophoric gases like silane, phosphine, and diborane. I'm also working on an easy carbon disulfide synthesis, so be sure to stay tuned for that. And speaking of subscribing, thank you all very much for getting lab coats over the 20,000 subscriber milestone. I honestly never thought this day would come, and I really have Nile Red to thank for my recent spike in popularity. So Nile Red, if you're out there, thanks a lot, and maybe consider giving Selenium a shot for your next stinky project. As always, a huge thanks goes out to all the Lab Coats patrons. This channel truly wouldn't be where it is today without them. Stay safe everyone, and I'll catch you next time. Lab Coats, out.